We're back to the Neil Haley Show, also the media giant effect and celebrity interviews live from the grotto with Greg Hanna. Greg, what's going on, man? How are you? And I'm already excited as can be to finally meet uh, this guest face to face. He was on my podcast radio show six years ago. Greg, I know you're excited. You're a huge fan of Cobra Kai, aren't you? Oh, yeah. That's amazing show. Enjoyed the first five seasons. I'm going to have to ask you to put Sean in a headlock and find out when season six is coming out. Oh yeah. see Sean might have not heard in the last interview when we did is I'm a former pro wrestler. I see Sean getting in this great shape. I'm again, trying to get in really good shape as well to maybe return back to the ring. I went wow. ahead and uh, had, so maybe we're going to have to have a match who knows, but I'm <laughs> welcome. again, I'm going to talk about it later in this show. Sean Kanan again, Cobra Kai, Karate Kid, uh, we talk so much about soap operas, but you're a Pittsburgher, Sean. Yeah. You know what? And Newcastle, uh, I remember some of the conversations. Great to have you back on again. And, you know, when I think about specifically enough your career and did you ever think this was going to happen to you, especially the kind of the career it's gone, the path, the success you've had, and then even the further success that's kind of catapulting you this year and, and since back with Cobra Kai and your book and everything. You know, that's that's a tough question to answer, uh, because at the risk of sounding arrogant, here's the thing, you know, as a young kid coming from Western Pennsylvania, moving out to Hollywood in 1987, if on some crazy level, I didn't believe this was going to happen, who the hell else was going to believe it? Right. So, you know, I, I talk about it, I have a black belt in being my own cheerleader because you have to be. Um, but I mean, I am humbled and I am just you know, continually amazed at, at all the blessings that have been coming my way. Uh, the last two years have been really ex extraordinary. Um, you know, I know they've been very difficult for a lot of people with COVID. Um, two years ago, um, my year started doing back-to-back -back movies with Bruce Willis. And uh, from there, it went to, uh, uh, you know, doing Cobra Kai and uh, uh, then getting uh, brought back on to The Bold and the Beautiful. And it's just been it's been it's been going great since then. So, I, 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 like I said, I'm humbled. Absolutely. Go ahead, Greg. First question. Wow, fantastic. First question. Uh, what style wait, of martial arts? Wait, are hold you, on, uh, Greg. Greg, where the hell are you? It looks like some kind of wine cellar S and M dojo thing. What do you got going on there? That's <laughs> that's my wine cellar in my basement. Yeah, yeah what's going on back by the red light there? Oh yeah, that's cool. <laughs> it, it's a it's a it's a false uh, jail gate. There's it Got just you. backs up to a wall. No, wait, let me ask you a question, though. Are you are are you from Newcastle? No, because there's a lot of Hannahs in Newcastle. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I didn't know because Hannah was a really there's a um, Howard Hannah who's a, a real estate guy and a, yeah. Okay. A lot of Hannahs. Um, cool. Okay. What style? I'd have to go to um, Newcastle. <laughs> <laughs> I started studying uh, Shotokan with Sensei William Stoner in Newcastle, Pennsylvania. Uh, I think I was about 14 or 15 years old. And um, our dojo then converted to um, something called Itosokai. Uh, and and it's it's now called Gembukai, but it's really very similar to what Mr. Miyagi teaches Daniel. It's kind of ironic that, you know, having played the, the bad guy in Karate Kid 3, I actually, my training is pretty close to what what mr miyagi taught daniel and then over the years um i've studied different martial arts a little smattering uh of uh brazilian jiu-jitsu um, um krav maga um uh, american kickboxing so i like to joke that i can get my ass kicked in about five different styles <laughs> <laughs> and you know and so a lot you're one of the only like when we look at the first karate kid Sean, I, I watched the making of it, like, and specifically, I think, it was, I think it was on Reels. And it was just uh -huh. so amazing to look at all that stuff. But a lot of the people that were in the first Karate Kid were not trained in martial arts at all. And I don't know about Karate Kid too, but then meaning that that, that that was their background. You had that background going into Karate Kid. Well, well two, two guys specifically in Karate Kid are unbelievable martial artists. The first is Sensei Ron Thomas, who played Bobby. And then, of course, Grandmaster Daryl Vidal, who played Vidal at the, uh, uh, you know, at the All Valley Tournament, um, is the inventor of the crane kick, and he is a tenth degree black belt in uh, Kempo. So those two guys did have really strong, much stronger than me, martial arts backgrounds. Um, it was really fortuitous that I had studied martial arts for, you know, about four years. Um, I don't 
think I would have gotten the part without it because I just don't know how you take somebody that has no martial arts background and makes them look like they're a national champion. I mean, they, mm-hmm. they had enough trouble with me because, you know, I mean, I had, I had a really strong, um, foundation but there were some things i i just couldn't do and so they took what i could do and you know we we went with that um in the karate kid too i don't know exactly what yuji's um martial arts background is i do know that um billy zabka and yuji have now trained extensively obviously um so i mean you know they're they're both pretty good um you know and ralph is is continually trained and has, has improved as the years have gone on. So, um, you know, uh, I, I think, I think there's, um, there's a scale, you know, there's there, like you said, there's some people that, uh, had, had minimum, uh, uh experience, some that had quite a bit. Wow. Oh, and Thomas, Thomas Ian Griffith, of course, is a, a black belt. He's a, he's a terrific martial artist. Oh, that's pretty terrific. Do you guys in the cast hang out uh, outside of uh, filming and so on or not really? I mean, you know, I, I, I see the guys, um, you know, over the years, I've seen the guys at different events. Um, and uh, uh, Martin Cove and I did a play together. Uh, mm-hmm. Probably saw Marty the most uh, was recently, not recently, but maybe about five months ago, six months ago was on his uh, podcast. And, you know, the thing is that <clears throat> even, though we don't see each other that often it's like you're part of a kind of an exclusive club a fraternity um well fraternity and sorority um you know we we have this common experience that we've all gone through and we're all part of this amazing fandom and so it it serves as a bond uh and we're able to kind of pick up right where we left off from the last time we saw each other and I think it changes in some ways of hanging out, Greg, when it's social media. If Sean is staying on his social media and making sure he's connecting or tagging or looking at some of the other guys that are doing the social, it's an important part of it, especially when the show airs on Netflix, right? When it first launched, you're like, I'm jumping on this because this is an opportunity to build a new fan base. I have a huge fan base because of the soap opera now I'm going to get a young fan base, people that maybe forgot about me, and it's like bringing them all back again. And it's amazing, like right? It just blows up so fast in social media, faster than you could ever imagine. It is. You know, I, my, my wife pointed something out to me, and I, I didn't even think about it. She said, you realize that you are currently on the number one daytime show in the world, Bold the Beautiful, and you're on the number one show in the world cobra kai and i said well when you put it like that uh <laughs> it, it, you know that's that's pretty good and I, I've, I've always been very good i guess in my career at grabbing onto big coattails so uh, very happy to uh uh have been able to do that you know with the, these shows that have got these uh, you know mega milton uh, built-in fan bases mm-hmm. oh, that's incredible you know when we were uh <clears throat> catching up neil and i earlier he told me you wrote a book so I love Amazon. I jumped right on. I ordered a copy. It's only in paperback. Yeah, the one on the left, on, on your right, that one that's right there. That's the one yeah, I got. The yeah. First one. yeah, that's yeah. Way so the I'm Cobra. all excited. Tell me, what am I going to expect to see in that book? So, way the Cobra is structured. That I'm a sensei. You are a student in my dojo. The chapters are divided into belts. Cobra is an acronym. It's formed from the words character, optimization balance, respect, and abundance. And these are the strategies and the philosophy that I've used to achieve some of the success in my life and also to uh, overcome some pretty significant challenges. I draw on some autobiographical stories to uh, to illustrate some of the lessons. Um, and I'll tell you, I hear from people all over the world literally every day that they're making monumental paradigm shifts in their life. Um, this is uh, springboarded me into an incredible sort of uh, third career as as an excellence coach, um, which I just love doing. I love working with people. I love inspiring people. Um, and the sequel to uh, Way of the Cobra, Welcome to the Kumite, uh, just came out December 10th. And if you like Way of the Cobra, you're going to love Welcome to the Kumite. Uh, the tagline for Welcome to the Kumite is conquer your greatest opponent, which of course is you yeah absolutely and well, you, you know, know what, I, gotta, I gotta give the, i gotta give the rest of the plug you can get yeah. the books at way of the you can get way of the cobra on amazon too but 
Welcome to the Kumite is currently only available on at wayofthecover.com. So tell us about this excellence coaching. Now you're going to be the next Tony Robbins it's kind of <laughs> in a different way. And you're doing the greatest thing out there is the fact that you, you're, you're an actor, you're a working actor, you've worked for so many years, and you're learning from a lot of these guys, successful people like The Rock, different people have taken not just what they're doing on film, but creating a lifestyle brand. It looks like you're going that direction, which is really a smart idea because people will only remember you from your last thing. And you're on television all the time. You're on Netflix all the time. You're building this young fan base. You can really build up from a strategy like you're doing when a lot of people that are working actors miss out on this. What, what got yeah, you, you know, I, I think it's mentors a, and stuff like that? It, it's, it's, it's been a concerted, um, an intentional personal choice on my part to do this. You know, my, you, you talked about the rock and, and guys that are, are actors and how they're, also segueing into doing a lot of this uh, lifestyle branding stuff. You know, I had an acting teacher and he said something really brilliant. He said, I have more in common with a successful plumber than I have in common with an unsuccessful acting teacher. And by that, he meant that the very same things that it takes to become successful in any pursuit, whether you're, uh, you know, a plumber, a baseball player, uh, you're in sales. There are certain things that you have to do to achieve success, certain common denominators, and it doesn't matter what you do. And, um, you know, my, uh, my coaching is, um, is one-on-one -on -one, and I am all about people. First of all, assuming responsibility, you know, your life is your fault where you are. If you're not happy, it's the sum total of all the decisions that you've made, both the good ones and the questionable ones. And I talk a lot about, the concept of story, how we as humans attach stories to the events in our life. And most of the time, human beings tend to attach um, negative and disempowering stories. And by flipping the script just a little bit, you can take the events that happen in your life and you can turn them into empowering stories. And I'll, I'll just really quickly give you an example. I had uh, a life-threatening injury while I was uh, in Karate Kid 3. And, you know, I could have I could have taken that and attached the story that, you know, the studio said that they were going to get rid of me, um, you know, no flowers, no balloons. I could have become jaded and said, you know, Hollywood is this really difficult, cold, hard place. That's one story. But instead, I attached the story that when the chips were down um, and I had to rally and, and kind of expose a part of my character that at 22, I didn't know existed. I did what was necessary, not only to, um, you know, rehabilitate myself, but to finish the movie and do all of my own martial arts stunts. And so that's the story that I carry around with me so that when things in my life get really tough, I say to myself, really, is it as tough as facing life-threatening surgery and being told that they don't know if they can save your life? I don't think so. And so that story drives me. That's great. That's awesome. You know, I guess back when, when I was coming up, we used to call that man and up. I don't know what you can man, call that right. these days, right? Man and up. <laughs> Real, real men are from Sean. Real men are from Pittsburgh, right? From That's Pittsburgh. Right. No, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm in, I'm in ta Dallas now, so I'm no longer in Pittsburgh. So we right. kind of move on in our lives away. Hey, thank, from hey, thank God they got for many brothers in the uh, airports now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so are you? So yeah, it's amazing. Anytime I take people to Pittsburgh and they have for many brothers, they're blown away by it. What's, what's your what's your what's your go to there? You know, I just the traditional one. How about you? Yeah. I like the traditional one, but I got to tell you, I like their fish sandwich too. Okay. They're, they're fried. I mean, it's not something I eat real often, you know? I know you're I, in great I, shape. You know, and you, you also, for I'm not having a salad. But you also got in even better shape, right? Yes. That's one of the I things you, I mean, you were jacked. I mean, that's what I'm saying. You're looking, you were going into the rock. I mean, once I saw you just jump in in the furniture store, I'm like, what the heck? Well, you know, I'm actually, I'm actually about 25 pounds lighter than when I did Cobra Kai. Um, I, I told you that at the beginning of that year, I did a film, did two films with Bruce Willis, one of which I played a, a, a special forces guy. And so I, I put on about 20 pounds for that role and I hadn't taken it all off by the time I did Cobra Kai. But um, uh, I, I think I probably weighed in at around like, I don't know, I probably weighed around 209 when I did um uh cobra kai and i'm about 186 right now okay. uh, you know part of it was you know I, I when i wrote way of the cobra it really was an epiphany for me and i i said to myself 
if I'm going to elevate myself to the position of a sensei giving advice, I must live my life the way that I'm talking about it in the book. I, I cannot be a hypocrite. And, um, you know, I quit drinking. Um, uh, that's something I talk about in the new book in Welcome to the Kumite, how, you know, I, I felt myself kind of slipping into mediocrity. And I knew that if I didn't slay a couple of dragons uh, that were demons in my own life, that I just wasn't going to be able to achieve what I wanted to achieve. And so I, I made some absolutely extraordinary life changes and they have had monumental effects on, on my life. And I, you know, I don't say that to impress people. I say it to impress upon them what is possible when you're willing to accept responsibility and make some changes. And the path, the path is easy. Uh, the path is, is simple, but it's not easy. Very, very good. Yeah, that's uh, important. That's the key. And for sure, Greg, ask the question you're asking every one of the celebrities we've interviewed so far, especially he's come up with this question and it's very powerful. Sean, let's see if you can answer it. And then I have a question for you. <laughs> okay. Because you've been ducking me for six years, but go ahead, Greg. Yeah. Awesome. Sean, you know, I'd, I'd love to ask this of successful people such as yourself, you know, to help my audience, my listeners, um, what's the most important thing that you feel that you've ever learned? If, um, I've distilled what I think it takes to be successful into four concepts. And this is what I tell young kids when they ask me. And I say, if you can do these four things, you've got about a 99% chance of being successful in life. That success may not look like exactly what you want it to look like. It may not happen on the timetable that you want it to happen, but you will be successful. The first is simple. We all know it. We learned it in kindergarten. It's the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Simple, right? Treat other people the way you wanted to be treated. The second one is act with integrity. Do what you say, say what you mean. When you give your word, follow through, but also be judicious when you give your word. Because once you've given it, you now have to live your life with compassion. And, and one of the best ways that uh, compassion and empathy, you know, we've all had that experience when you're standing in line at, uh, you know, uh, uh, the pharmacy or something, and you see some older person and they pull out their checkbook and you're in a hurry and they're writing a check and you get all this horrendous, crazy thoughts in your head. And, you know, you don't know if that person is deciding whether they can buy their husband's medication for the night or if they have dinner. And so, you know, you never know what private war somebody else is fighting. And so if we all just take a breath and, and look at each other and treat each other with a little more civility, a little more understanding. And I, I go into that a little more before I tell you the last one. I, yeah, I go into it a little more in, in the, um, the second book. And I, I talk about how we've got to stop looking at groups of people and people as monolithic. In other words, no, no person is completely good, completely bad. No group thinks this way and only this way. There are shades of gray within people and shades of gray within groups. And it's okay to disagree with someone's idea without eviscerating their humanity. And then the last one is simple, grind, grind, get up early, work hard, make sure that you're bringing value to every relationship that you have. Um, you know, I'm a firm believer that in very, very, very few um, uh, very, very few times in life that things have to be a zero sum game where for me to win, you have to lose. So I always look for how can I win? How can I get what I want? But how can I also help you get what you want? And that's especially important for something like in sales. You know, anyone can kind of get over on somebody one time, whatever, but that's not what it's about. When you act with integrity, you act with character and you help other people ach achieve their dreams, that is the quickest way for you to achieve your dreams. And if you do those four things consistently, you're going to be a successful human being. That's Amazing. great. That's great. Now, you know, Sean, one follow up to that real quick. It, was, it, it just really sunk to me what you just said. You know, Wallace Waddles, who wrote The Science of, uh, you know, Becoming Wealthy or Getting Rich, you know, says that it's so mm -hmm. important that you deliver value to somebody well in advance Absolutely. of the amount of monetary gain that, that you get from them. And that, that's, yeah. you know, I, I came up with, I came, I came up with something else in the sequel to the book. I'm a huge proponent of this. I talk about staying out of the results. Okay. 
a lot of people are result oriented. What is a better usage of your time is creating a bulletproof system. Let me explain what a system is. A system is a series of habits, okay? So think about when you get in the car, you've got a system. Uh, that system is you get in the car, you check your mirrors, you put your seatbelt on, you check behind you, you turn the ignition on, you go and you achieve the result. The result is to get to the destination and to get there safely, right? So if you can create a bulletproof process for everything that you do, Okay, and you tweak the process doing self diagnostics based on new information coming in, but you're constantly trying to refine the process, whether it's the way that you deal with customers, the way that you relate to your, your partner, the way that you relate to your kids, whatever it is, if you put all the effort into the process, the results will come. That's it. There you go. Now, mm -hmm. Sean, the results will come. You've been ducking me for six years. I'm former pro wrestler. <laughs> ready to get back in the ring. What, you know, your karate, let's go ahead and do a pro <laughs> wrestling match in Dallas, Texas, or in Los Angeles. You're going to have to face a, a nearly seven foot tall media giant versus you. Are you going to me? I'm 6'10". I'm 6'10", I'm Sean. Are you really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what? I will absolutely wrestle you. I've got one request, okay? okay. I need $5 million in cash. Hey, we'll get the promoters to get it done. Let's you, do get it. Me, you get me $5 million and I will wrestle you. Okay, let's see what's <laughs> figured out. We got to go fund me now. See, again, another person trying to duck me $5 million. <laughs> let's call Vince McMahon. Let's call AEW. One of you guys needs to put Sean Cannon in the ring and maybe it'll happen now because you did yeah, my right. show and you better give me a piece. I'm going to have to get a step ladder. Huh? <laughs> what what name did you wrestle under? Oh, Big Neil, the real deal. Uh, That's a great Man, name. Giant Warrior, uh, G and Butch Bronson, as I said, and and I did a Jason gimmick. All these different things. <laughs> Were you in the saw. WWF? No, I did TV once with them. Wrestled Crush and Savia Vega. Did a tour in Germany. Retired, became a teacher, and then brought back into my entertainment game. So I, I love your, Sean. I bet your kids don't mouth off to you. Oh, they know a mouth off to me. That's for sure. And especially you. You're not going to mouth off to me because you're ducking me $5 million, Greg. You got oh, here he goes. He's going into but, the wrestling thing now, right? But yes, I am. <laughs> Write a check right now. I am not <laughs> ducking you, man. Greg, Five million bucks. I'm there. I'll okay. put my knee pads on okay. and I'm ready to go. Okay. Off the <laughs> buckle, baby. I've never wrestled. I've never wrestled at all, but I've watched it. All right. <laughs> Give me that good. hard. <laughs> All right. Appreciate it, guys. All right. That was Celebrity Interviews live from the Garada with Greg Hanna. Take care.